One. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's one more session with Father Antonio. Uh, Father will, uh, is arranging the dates with him at the moment. Uh, they're trying to figure it out. But it'll be a two day affair. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So, yes. <laughs> uh, so, let's begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty Father, we ask that you pour down your Holy Spirit upon us to enlighten our minds and our heart to receive thy word and thy wisdom. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So today is kind of like we've gone through this whole journey and it's going to come ending on basically the Christian life and before we do do that so I'm what I'm planning trying to do today is connect for you the sacraments and prayer life all right the two sometimes they're kind of disassociated or we don't know how they relate or we get confused there's going to be some cl um, clarity on what's prayer. Um, just understand what I'm going to teach about prayer. I'm not saying any other forms of prayer aren't valid. It, every, every form of prayer is valid, yeah? But there is a very specific type of prayer I'm going to talk about. Um, but to begin with, uh, the first half will be, was well, three. The first bit will be just a recollection on who Christ is. And then we're going to look at the sacraments. And then we're going to look at prayer. So it's a threefold thing today. And, um, and without, uh, we'll get straight into it to recall ourselves the, the identity of Jesus, because it's all, it's all focusing on him. And uh, as it was discussed, God is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one of the, I said, there's two foundational things about Christianity. God is trinity, and Jesus is fully human, fully divine. And um, we get to the second point. Is he going to read for us? Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father. So John, straight off the bat, is saying that the Word is God, and that the Word became flesh, and that the Word is the only begotten Son of the Father. So... The Word, the Word is the Son. And then we have this, so he, he opens with that. And the Word would have been Logos. Uh, back, you know, he would have written Logos, the, the, the uh, reasoning of God. Um, and then he goes on to reveal. And from this fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the opening goes... Word, Son, Jesus. So he works his revelation into saying, boom, and it's Jesus. And actually, I didn't put it in because there's so many slides today. Uh, there's so much I wanted to say, but I couldn't. Um, if you go and read John's letter, he's even more emphatic, yeah? He says, we met life himself. Life came to us in the flesh. So he goes from word to son to life. Life became incarnate, right? And its name is Jesus Christ. He keeps going on and on about it. So Jesus is the Word, the Son of God, who became flesh. And John doesn't stop there. John goes on. And John tells us... <laughs> yeah. To all who received them, who believed in his name, he gave power to become sons of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. Right. So he gave us power to become sons of God. You'll see that translation put in there as children. Yeah. yeah? In the Latin it's fili, which means sons. And I've intentionally done that. Right? Because I know, yes, we do become children of God. But what we'll see is... He gave us the power to become sons of God because who is Jesus? The Son of God. The Son of God. So he gave us the power to participate in his life. Mm -hmm. That's the key point. All right? So, yes, when we participate in his sonship, we become children of God. But if you kind of eradicate the, you know, disconnect son from son, yeah, you kind of bury the, what John is trying to say. And this power to become sons of God, it's not by blood. It's not by 
the will of our flesh. Oh, I can do it myself. Yeah. Uh, and nor the will of man. The power to become so is born. You have to be born of God. Right? So it's kind of indicating where it's coming from. So the mission of Jesus Christ, the Son of God became flesh to make us sons of God. To make us participate in his sonship. Sonship. We, what we need to understand is that Jesus is the divine son of the Father in the Trinity. It's a divine reality he's come to give us. And that's why he's saying it doesn't come from flesh. It doesn't come from blood. It comes from God. And Jesus has come to give us a participation in the divine sonship he possesses. It's him. In the Trinity. It's a Trinitarian reality he's come to give us. And he has come to raise us up into the supernatural relation. To bring us into the inner life of God. Through his sonship. And Jesus has come to give us his life. His divine life. What does Jesus come to say constantly? I've come to give life. life. Alright? So don't underestimate how infinitely beyond us this is. Right? It's beyond us. That's why John's saying this doesn't this could you can't will this in. Yeah? You can't it isn't it isn't something we pass down. It is given to us. It is because it's it's God that has been given to us. When we receive his life, we are participating in the life of the Trinity. So back to this analogy of steel and fire to drive this home a bit further. Because this will all make sense when we come to the sacraments and prayer. <coughs> Remember, we are like pieces of steel. And the divine life of Christ is like a burning fire. This is how the fathers of the church communicated this. Steel has no capacity within itself to set itself on fire. Steel is steel. It has no capacity within itself. It must receive fire. Equally, we have no capacity within us to create the divine life of the Son. But we have been made to receive the divine life of the Son. That's very important. We have been made to receive. Um, again, it's not in this, but it's, it's something I've been working on. In Genesis, it says, um, Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. And then it goes on, male and female, he created them. Go to the letter of Paul. So man was made in the image. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, says, Christ is the image of God. Now, if Christ is the image, and we've been made in the image, then we have been made in the image of Christ. So we are fundamentally made... To receive his divine life. Because we are like him. Not identical. We are, we are and as they would say, we are like an icon of Christ. And so we, we have our human nature. The way God has constructed us is like steel with fire. Humanity with the divine life of the Son. All I'm trying to get across is that Jesus is trying to give us his life. We've been made to receive the divine life of the Son. This is the purpose of our existence. So we're all out there, like I was saying, my homie, trying to satisfy ourselves. Oh, will this new pair of shoes give me what I'm looking for? You know what I mean? No, because what you're looking for is divine life. You know what I mean? Yeah? Will doing better than my colleague give me what I'm looking for? You know what I mean? So we enter into this false competition of trying to outdo it. But it's, it's not, it's not going to give us anything. Uh, there is one thing we should be in competition with each other about. Paul says it. Yeah? We, be, we should be trying to outdo each other in, in love. Right? If you want to be in competition, Paul says, do it in love. Yeah? So, listen to what Jesus teaches. Right? So we have this gift of the divine life I'm saying that Jesus is trying to give us. Uh, do you want to read these for me? So listen carefully. See, can you pick up on the words? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, 
unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. He who abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So what word was jumping out? Abide. Abide, yeah. And now he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Which is saying, you know, you can't, like, as I said, steel cannot set itself on fire. He said, you, what, you, what you want, what you've been made for, you can't have apart from me. But notice what he says here. There's this mutual indwelling. Abide in me, and I abide in you. So, Jesus is quite emphatic that we are to abide in him, and he is to abide in us. It's this mutual indwelling that has to take place. I do apologize for going a bit fast, because I'm trying to get to uh, prayer. <laughs> uh, but I want to get there in a, in a, in a context. That's my, my key. So Jesus teaches us that when we abide in him and he abides in us, then we will bear fruit. The thing we're looking for will suddenly, ah, you know, I have it. His, why? Because his life will be in us. The very thing John's gospel opens up with, saying this is what he's come to give. And in order for divine life to ignite within us, in order for it us to participate in the life of the Trinity as the Son does. We need to abide in Christ, and Christ needs to abide in us. So the big question should be, how? How does that happen? How do we attain this mutual indwelling? Jesus has given us two key sacraments for us to attain this mutual indwelling. Baptism and the Eucharist. Eucharist. All right. So these two sacraments are ordered to creating this mutual indwelling within us. So let's examine how these sacraments attain this mutual indwelling. And I'm going to use the language of marriage again. All right. And which will then lead us into prayer. So let's begin with baptism. I always begin by saying, I think it's one of the most undeveloped. St. Augustine, when I was reading St. Augustine, St. Augustine was hot on this, and so was uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Jesus teaches us that in marriage, two become one. Yes? So he says, two <coughs> become one in marriage. So our baptismal union with Christ, what happens when we're baptized? Yes, we're, we're, we're forgiven our sins. Yeah? But remember, I said, don't stop there. Jesus hasn't come to just forgive us our sins. He's come, Jesus very clear. I've come to give you life. life. In order to receive life, yes, we need to be reconciled. But so many people just announce the good news as he died for our sins. Boom. And people are kind of going, okay. That's very nice of them. Yeah? Because and, and the good news kind of falls flat. Yeah? But you're there kind of, no, he, he, he died for our sins so we can have life is the full is the fullness. So, when we are baptized, we are joined, we are incorporated into the body of Christ. St. Paul is emphatic on this. We are made one with the body of Christ. We are taken up into his mystical body. And the way I always teach younger kids this, I said, this church actually helps. Um, if, you go, if you fly high... And you were to look down on the church while we're all at Mass. What shape is this church in? Cross. A cross. Who makes up the body of the, of the cross in the church? Jesus. Jesus. You do. You are the body of Christ. So when the, when the Mass is happening, you're not just watching. Yeah? But you are being mystically incorporated into the whole sacrifice of the Mass. Okay? So why? Because you're baptized into him. You are participating in his body and his life. So since marriage joins two people together, and since baptism joins us to the body of Christ, you could say baptism is like a form of marriage. It produces the same effect. It joins two people together. 
And when we enter into the mystical body of Christ, we are born into a new life with God. A new, a new reality opens up to us. A new possibility opens up to us. So this is St. Paul. Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. This is a great mystery and means in reference to Christ and the church. Paul's struggling to say just how profound baptism is here. All right? This is a great mystery. Great mystery. Profound mystery is what he's saying. That we are mystically, when we're baptised, operating within the life of Christ. Or actually, let's reverse it. Christ's life's operating on us. <coughs> Peter uses the same kind of language, but instead of body, he uses temple. But if we remember, what does Jesus say about his body? It is a temple. So temple and body for Jesus are the same thing, right? His body is a temple. So listen to what St. Peter says. If we recall that Jesus referred to his body as a temple, oh, listen to what Peter <laughs> says. <laughs> right, come to him, to that living stone, rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious and like living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house so peter sees that we are stones being added to christ yeah being built not into separate churches but one temple with christ right so what i'm trying to get across is baptism as paul says in its deepest mystery is an incorporation of being brought into the mystical body of Christ. It isn't a membership in the sense you get a card. Yeah, I'm well done. You're now a Catholic. Yeah, Paul says, no, yeah, something insanely profound is happening here. And uh, the do you want to uh, read the catechism? The catechism, baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. Therefore, we are members one of another. So we are related to Christ now, right? Mm -hmm. So baptism, we can see that through baptism we are brought into the body of Christ. We are made one with this body. We live, abide, and participate in his bodily life. Born into a new way of living. And this is so essential. Why does it matter? Because <coughs> when we abide in his body, we can live according to his spirit. All right? What does Jesus Christ possess within him? The Holy Spirit. Holy spirit. He possesses the Holy Spirit. If you are brought into the body of Christ, yeah, you are brought into the life of the Holy Spirit. And that's why they say you now have become spiritual people, because you're operating to Christ's spirit. So, this is our abiding in him, in baptism. Right? See, we're brought into him. That's what I'm just trying to get across. Is that making sense for people? Mm -hmm. If we abide in Christ through baptism, how does Christ come to abide in us? This is an important question. Because when Christ dwells in us, the divine Son of God dwells in us. The life that Jesus promised abides in us. Remember, this mutual indwelling. He's emphatic. Abide in me and I in you. Abide in me and I in you. Yeah? Through baptism we abide in him. The Eucharist. Now, can you read these uh, two for me? The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. So the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives Life. And what does Jesus say he's going to give us? Life. And they're like, life, give me that bread. And what does he keep reading? What does he say? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Right? 
It's me. So, um, do you want to read the next one for me? <clears throat> the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give, up, give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So hear that? So if you, if, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you abide in me, and I abide in you. So Jesus is emphatic. How does my life come into you? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it was a controversial teaching. Seriously controversial. Do you want to, do you want to read that one for me? Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? So who walked away? The Pharisees? No? Was it the Pharisees? Was it the pagan? No, it was the disciples. Yeah. They said, This is, this is, this who... This, in one thing, though, this is intolerable language, they said. Intolerable, yeah? Because, and Jesus is saying, like, I'm sorry, but does he go running after them? No, he does not. He lets them leave because this is the teaching. This is the truth. Jesus abides in us when we eat his flesh and drink his blood, which he gives to us in the Holy Eucharist. All right? So we have this mutual indwelling taking place through baptism and the Holy Eucharist. We abide in Christ, we're in his body, and he's operating on us according to his spirit. And then we receive him, and his life is in us. Right? And we're now going to come... Yeah, good, I'm on, I'm on track. Sorry, this bit I had to get through quick. I do apologise, because it's prayer I really, I really want to break open. So if baptism... Is like a marriage, joins two people together. We are wedded to Christ and made one with him. Then our reception of the Eucharist is the consummation of this marriage. All right? Person who waxes lyrically on this is Augustine. Oh, what you know, he he just saw it as a great marriage and wedding. Yeah? And so if baptism is like a marriage, then the Eucharist is the consummation of the marriage. Through the Eucharist, the life of Christ comes to abide in us. We are in communion with the Son. It completes our baptism. Our baptism is left bereft without the Eucharist. Bereft. Right? Um, now we get to it. Now we get to it. All right? The two shocking questions I'm going to present to you. However, if the Eucharist is Christ abiding in us, if it is our communion with the fire of the Son's divine life, the consummation of our baptism, if it is the way we participate in the life of the Trinity, then how come I don't see immediate effects? And why do I have to keep receiving it? You know, so many people have come to me over the years, I stopped going to Mass because behaviour is on people. I stopped going to Mass, you know, this and that. And really what they're saying is, Christianity makes this claim, and I don't see it. Yeah, that the divine life of the Son should be dwelling within us. And I'm not seeing it. Right? And yes, it's true. But what we're going to see, why? Why? And boy, oh boy, oh boy, are the saints. Like, you know, I mean, people, just go back and read the saints. We have these trailblazers who've gone before us, right? And, uh, and open this up. And this is where prayer is going to start coming in. Because we're baptized in Christ to become spiritual people. And spiritual people are made for the Eucharist. So I want you to imagine... This is why I use the marriage thing, right? 
I want you to imagine that the goal of the Christian life is to go from a wedded union with Christ to a consummated union with him. That's, you know, you should feel that desire to, you know, be baptized to go further into a consummated union with Christ. Where we not only dwell in Christ, as so many people do, we just, we're just in Christ dwelling, yeah? But Christ dwells in us permanently. And there's a key word. So, wedded union, and the goal is to go from a wedded union to a consummated union. Is that clear? Yeah. It's one big problem. There's a massive obstruction. There's a huge obstruction in our life to this. Massive. The key, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, the little flower, Therese of Vesu, yeah? Theophan the Recluse, St. Joseph the Hesychat, you name them, right? You name them. They go, the most essential aspect of the Christian life is to understand what this obstacle is and how to unblock it. Because we're receiving the divine life of God and we're struggling to have him permanent, let's say this way, permanently remain within us, abide in us. The overcoming of this obstacle, this obstruction, is the battle. If you take anything away from to, uh, all our courses, take this away. It is the battle. It is it. Of the Christian life. And it is sadly the most neglected. So we, we sacramentally get into this state, but we do nothing about this. Right? And yet, it's the most rewarding to deal with this. And this is like this. This is what will set you on fire. So you better take a photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yep. So, the often the recluse. Who read last? Did you? you? You have the joy of reading one of my new favorite spiritual writers. Brilliant. Yeah. So read these two things. Take a person who is far from mortal sin and lives according to the external aspects of the Christian life. Despite all their correctness, they have no inner peace. They lack what was promised to true Christians, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Troubled by this realization, they look inwards. And what do you think they find there? Ceaseless, mm -hmm. ceaseless wandering of thoughts, constant onslaughts from the passions, hardness and cooling of heart, obstinacy, Yep. And disobedience, desire to do everything according to their own will. In a word, they find everything within themselves in a very bad state. Now, when I read that, he nailed my inner life. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely nailed it. Uh, onslaughts from the passions. Do we know what the passions are? If, you know, there are emotions. They're the things that move us. Love, hate, all that. And uh, they rule us in an unorderly way, you know. Best example, if you ever want to see um, an unorderly passion, is watch me around chocolate. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> there is absolutely no temperance. Yeah? Greed, everything just takes over, yeah? I am a slave to my passions, right? Uh, anger is another passion. Um, anger, you know what I mean? It's constantly being set off. You're being moved by it. Yeah. So here we are. We're baptized in Christ, receiving the Eucharist. But Theophan's saying, "But this is you. This is who you are. This is a problem. This is the interior life we are often asking our Lord to come abide in within us. Understand that. This is not good. All right." We can abide in Christ, but can Christ truly abide in us? Right? This is, this is the big thing that the saints are on about. Can he truly abide permanently? Or is our interior life at war with him? Right? And that's why the sacrament has been called the sacrament of healing, because he's trying to, in the, when we receive constantly, he's trying to cool us, trying to warm us, trying to seduce us. Do you understand? But 
We have to engage in this battle. So, the construction of the kingdom, the restoration of our inner life is... Please, understand this now. This is a serious trap. The restoration of our inner life is not something we can accomplish. How do we know? God gave the Israelites the law. But the law had absolutely no power to transform them. And what St. Paul said, all the law could do was reveal to me my sins. Yes, yeah. Had zero. So don't, don't think that, oh, I'm going to open up a self-help book and read how to be a good person and I'll magically become great. God already did it, people, with the Israelites. Gave them the perfect law. Follow this. Incapable. Right? So, it's a heresy called Pelagianism when you think you can do it yourself. Right? That's what the Pelagian heresy is about. When you think, I can do this. And so, I love virtues. I love the language of virtues. But there's this temptation to read about virtues. This is a temperance person. This is someone who's balanced. This is, oh, this is all I have to do. Just practice the virtues. Go ahead. Try practice the virtues. See how far you get. You know what I mean? Yeah? Just wait for that one person to annoy you. <laughs> From crashing down. Yeah? All it can do, even when you try to practice the virtues, all it can do is reveal to you, I can't. Right? I can. But this is the beauty of being brought into the, into the life of Christ. Abiding in Him. This is the beauty. The Holy Spirit. It's His job to transform us interiorly. This is what we're not allowing. The reason we are baptized into Christ. There's many, but I'm reducing it to this. Yeah? Is that in Christ, we can participate in the life of His Spirit. Which is the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Christ is, you know. And this was prophesied. And I, this is your bedside. You're about to read one of my most favorite prophecies or pieces of scripture. I've got a few. This is one of them. I love it. Yeah? Understand. Understand that. Yeah, yeah. All right, don't mess it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. That God is talking about, I gave you the law, and you're useless, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm going to do. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out your heart, your flesh, and I will take out your flesh, the heart of of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. So what's he he going to... I'm going to give you a new heart. How? I'm going to give you a new... Spirit. Spirit. And when we're baptized into Christ, what do we receive at baptism? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. And so it is the prerogative of the Holy Spirit to take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. This is the battle. This is it. This is everything. We want this sacramental reality to take effect in us. This change has to begin. We cannot do it ourselves. So it begins with the prayer life. The kingdom of God is first and foremost an internal transformation in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only when the kingdom of God has been made in us can the kingdom of God be truly manifested externally. And one of our temptations is to go back to the law, look at how God constructs, would want to construct his kingdom, come up with politics and laws and rules and say, I don't have to entirely transform myself. We'll just impose the kingdom of God onto the world. Yeah, That's a disaster. The kingdom of God is manifested when all of us are entirely transformed. And then when people look at us and they see how we live this new life, that's the kingdom they're looking at. Do you understand? The kingdom of God is a manifestation 
of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And that is so, the temptation to just think, ah, I just come up with a set of rules and we all follow it and we'll all be happy. Who set of rules? Your rules, my rules. <laughs> it's, like, it's a disaster. And we see this temptation, to, you could call it the construction of a utopia, over and over again, this temptation that if I'm in charge, I could make a utopia. And if everyone just did what I said, yeah, everything would be great. That's not how it works. God says, the way this works, I'm giving you a new spirit. So the spiritual life is the work of the Holy Spirit, not our work. And that does not mean we're not involved, but it means any, you know, it's by the empowerment, the Holy Spirit, Spirit will empower us to do it. So do not be fooled. The spiritual life in the beginning and all the way through is a battle. Oh boy, is it a battle. It involves putting the old self to death. And believe me, your old self is not going to die without a fight. All right? If you just think your old self is just going to keel over and die, you're in for a shock. Father. Truly, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. All right. So there it is, the, you know, the spiritual command to die. It's frightening when you hear it. But we are spiritually commanded to die. Right? And we'll see how we die. So, do you remember I said uh, there, was the wedded cons uh, there was the wedded union and the consummated union and we got to go from here to here but there's an obstruction. Well, the spiritual giants have worked out the unblocking of this obstruction has three movements. All right, There's three movements to constructing the kingdom of God. There's three movements to uh, putting the old self to death. There's three movements to removing the obstruction. And three days to resurrection. And three days to resurrection. Amen, sister. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> what are these three movements? You've probably heard me, who's ever doing catechesis with the confirmation, go on about them. But there's a reason why I go on about them. Yeah, They are the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. Has anyone ever heard of them? You have. Right, okay. They're not just random words. Yeah, These are people, these Three expressions have come from saints, right? East and West. I've checked both, and they both say, it's incredible, they both say the exact same thing. Um, but what you have to understand is, in each state, we relate to the Eucharist. So we relate to Christ in a purgative way, we relate to Christ in, a, in an illuminative way, and we relate to Christ in a unitive way. All right? It's all relational. And so, yes, we start here. But then we'll progress through it. And what it, what, whenever you read it, what it sounds like... Oh, sorry, yeah. This progression is empowered by the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Eucharist. So God, this purgative, illuminative, and unitive is the words we use to describe the transformation of our interior life into the kingdom of God. So remember what we're, what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on the removal of this obstruction to Christ permanently abiding in us. And what the saints have said, this obstruction is removed in three movements. Right? Um, I'm going to focus on the purgative today, because that's the illuminative, if any ever you get there, please tell me. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the unitive is, you'll see, it'll make sense now. So to kind of give you an idea of how this 
relents. You can imagine the Holy Spirit is doing this, yeah? And we constantly are relating to the Eucharist. And you can see, as we journey, they're coming into a point of contact for a permanent, right? So in the beginning, we are far from the state of Christ permanently abiding in us. As Theoph in the Recluse said, you know, we're at war, our passions, uh, it's, it's an unha- unha- uninhabitable yeah, dwelling place for our Lord. But as the Holy Spirit transforms the life of uh, transforms us, the life of Christ begins to manifest within us. And as we go deeper, it will it will keep getting more and more until we start to become one with Christ, and it will result in a consummation. All right. And the writings on this. Has anyone ever read John the Cross? You heard of him? Yeah, all right. John the Cross talked about this, all right? You know, and so Teresa of Avila. And sometimes it's a bit difficult with Catholic saints because what they don't tell us, the Catholic saints are amazing at describing what each relation is like. Which, um, but I found that the writings of the, of the East are a bit better at describing how to crack on with it. You know, all right? And so that's what we're, I'm going to bring to you today. A bit of this uh, Eastern wisdom. But in fairness, it comes from the Church Fathers. And it comes from the Desert Fathers, who we all share. Right? And, uh, but what I want you to understand is this. You know, when you receive the Eucharist, ah, I say most of us, I don't want to put you in a unit, but I'm saying me, I'm in here, right? This is where I am. So this is my relationship with the Eucharist at the moment, the divine life of the Son within me. I'm in a, this state. This trajectory isn't for saints. It is for saints, because you're all called to be saints. But my point is, this is for all of us. You're all meant to go through this. You're all supposed to be enjoying this. But I think we've just lost a bit of the know-how, or what the involvement is. And the illuminative state is, uh, they all talk about it, is that you, you begin to have what they call the vision of God in your life. You've seen divine providence, you see as God sees. It's like an extra light is added into the way you see things. And then the unitive state, that's where you would have descriptions of, let's say, uh, spiritual ecstasy, or insight, or just pure joy, you know, you know what I mean? So, a lot of people come to Mass and they receive the Eucharist and they walk out. And, 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 and you know, myself, is it like, I said, how often have I just snuffed out that fire of Christ within me? You know? Just with my rebellious spiritual life. So I receive the divine life and I go, poof, snuff out and go back out into the world. <laughs> so that's why the spiritual saints we're big on this. So let's look into it. The beginning of our spiritual transformation. Is, is everyone following this so far? If it's not, yeah? Right. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I'm, like, I'm, I'm having a bit of a problem. Yeah, here. When, I, when I relate this to the life of uh, St. Uh, Paul, yeah. you know Paul was able to crucify the body of yeah. Christ and all that. But eventually he went on to say, the very things that I don't want to do are the things that I do. Yeah. But the things I want to do are the things I, I can do. Yeah. yeah. So this is all the construction of the interior life with Christ, yeah? So I'm going the wrong way. What we'll see here is I'll just jump to the point. This is about pride. Right? This is about virtue. Right? And this is about conquering everything. It isn't we get completed perfect, yeah? So if you ever read the life of the saints, St. Anthony, the desert, or someone like that, uh, the spirit, like, this man is, like, advanced, yeah? Mm. But the spirit of fornication is harassing him, yeah? And, And so what it is, that once you begin this journey, Christ lets you battle each thing. You'll be victorious, yeah? But it isn't this instantaneous permanent, you know what I mean, yeah? 
what it is, is that your life, now you're being transformed. And Christ will give you uh, your opportunities to take on. That's what it's all. Yeah. And, and, and this, this builds virtue, people. Let me put it this way. Let me put it another way. We don't make our vir selves virtuous to approach Christ. We approach Christ and he makes us virtuous. Right? So Paul has crucified his life to Christ. Yeah? And now Christ is working within him. And he's saying, and Paul understands yeah, what's taking place within him. And the battle. It's a battle. Right? But he, what's he say to Christ? He says, uh, take, remove this thorn. Christ yeah. says, no. My, my grace, grace is, enough for me. is sufficient. You will overcome this. And when you do, you will be more virtuous. Right? And so... This is where it's, I always think of the because I'm probably an engineer, but it, I always think of the construction of a kingdom take within us. You know, you know they said Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, so there's a battle just going through us, but we have to begin with this stage, and this is the bit I want to focus on. And uh, and when you're in the illuminative stage, you'll come very aware of what you need to do and what the battle is, and you'll have more insight. Um, yeah, so as we become more transformed by the Holy Spirit, the Eucharist will manifest the divine life of the Son within us. You'll have that, everything you're looking for, you'll be relating to Him on a new level. So the beginning of our spiritual transformation, and I hope this is the bit that's going to bring more clarity. The early saints of the Church, especially the Desert Fathers, were obsessed Obsessed with one line uh, from the writings of St. Paul. Obsessed with it. I find it everywhere. Yeah. Do you want to read it for me? Um, very ceaselessly. <laughs> Obsessed with this sentence. Right? Their question was simple. What do you think their question was? How? How does one pray ceaselessly? Does anyone know who does anyone know who the uh, the desert of desert fathers are? So, yeah, in the very early years of Christianity, these men and women went out into the desert, yeah, and just prayed, and they they, they just just prayed, you know, yeah, no, you'll just like, but they lived in caves, they lived as hermits, they lived as, and they put all their writings down, and we still have their writings today. And, uh, and this is what I've discovered. In the East, this is incredible. In the East, they have a direct line of saints going back to the Desert Fathers. And what it is, one Desert Father, but one saint mentors the next one. And mentors the next one. So they have an unbroken line of mentoring in prayer. Going all the way back to these spiritual giants. And they've read it. It's all compiled in a book called the Philokia. Philokia, Philokia, yeah. And basically, it's a book on how to mentor people into prayer. All right? And so the question was simple when they started. How does one pray ceaselessly? For centuries, these spiritual uh, men and women, these spiritual giants, went out into the desert to pray. And in the crucible of the desert... They discovered the art of prayer. And what they discovered in prayer to begin this journey of the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive, or to put it differently, to begin this journey of allowing the Holy Spirit to construct the kingdom within us, they called it the ceaseless prayer of the heart. Or they called it the remembrance of God. Prayer is not a method or a simple reciting of words. Prayer is a state of being given to us, to God, to which every Christian is called. It's a state. And we're going to look at what this means in more detail. And instead of having a slide that will just say it, we're going to go through slides that will kind of open it up for you. 
But prayer is a state of being. This, this you have to, this, this is like the watershed moment. When one attains the ceaseless prayer of the heart, the mind and the heart are united in a fixed remembrance of God, in a permanent state of adoration and, and awareness. And according to the saints, this is what prayer means. It is a state of where the mind and the heart are connected in a constant awareness. The awareness of God never stops for them. And they say, Teresa Pissu, and I've, ch I've chatted to monks on the east, and monks on the West, so Orthodox and Catholics, they all say she perfected it. Do you know that? She had it par excellence. And they reckon she had it at the age of four. <laughs> she had, now Joseph, she still would have had to go through the illuminative and the unit of state. She still would have had to have done her battles. And if you read her writings, she has the battle. Yeah? Yeah. But she, she had the ceaseless prayer of the heart. And that's the beginning point. Prayer doesn't be, and I, I use this cautiously, but it was said to me very briefly. <laughs> it doesn't begin until you have this. All right? Only when this stage begins to take root within you will the Holy Spirit move you through the illuminative and the unity. And you can read all the writings. St. John of the Cross finally makes sense once you tweak this. St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila, yeah? The little flower, all right? Another person who they said had it. And was, this was an Orthodox monk who told me. He said, another saint who had the ceaseless prayer of the heart, even though she was in the dark night of the soul, Joseph, yeah? Uh, sorry to keep going back to it, yeah? Was Mother Teresa. Yeah. You know, she had it. So, Teresa, uh, Mother Teresa, you looked at her. She was the kingdom of God. Do you understand? It wasn't, you weren't looking out. She, she's it. And when one person <coughs> has the ceaseless prayer of the heart and is constructing the kingdom of God within them, they can do more to the world than all the books of philosophers ever could. Well, actually, books of philosophers do a lot of work to destroy it. But, the, but notice, like, when you get this ceaseless prayer of the heart, the ceaseless prayer of the heart, it's the beginning. It's the absolute beginning. So back to the Desert Fathers. Um, so by the way, just before I clarify, so this state of prayer is called the ceaseless prayer of the heart. It's where the mind and the heart are connected in a constant, never, never broken adoration of God all right you, you can't achieve this it's a gift right but it's not a gift for a few it's a gift for all of us and this is what I'm passionate about people rediscovering so as the desert fathers struggled and advanced in prayer they began to discover a sure path to attaining the ceaseless prayer of the heart and this is what there's just different ways you can do it I'm going to give you the sentence that I use right um, this way became known as the purgative way, and it consists of a single sentence. And you all know this sentence, yeah? But there's training that goes with the sentence. And I guarantee, especially uh, those who've been in the way and done stage two or three or something, you're given this. And you're given it with a little book, right? And tell me if you rec no, no, you tell me if you recognize it, because it's probably given to you and you passed over it, because I've been asking loads, yeah? Um, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me as sinner. Yeah? You did receive it? Yes. Yeah. You've all received the key. That was born, that sentence was born in the desert. Yeah? Now, it comes from the gospel. Does anyone know what, 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 what passage? Now, he doesn't say Lord Jesus Christ, but he's, he says something very similar. So, so no, no, Jesus. it's a parable by Jesus. Oh, was it the, uh, the, um, the, the when the yeah. Pharisee was saying that I know, please make me please. not like this man? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All, yeah. all I want to say is yeah. uh, tax collector. Yeah. Yeah. What's the tax collector say? Yeah. Yeah. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord God in heaven, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. What you got to understand is, I mean, you're 
bit of a brief history. Oh, no, I've got to hurry up. Um, a bit of brief history. They went to the desert. Do you know what they were saying? 150 psalms a day. 150 psalms a day. They were saying the Psalter a day. All right? And then they said, this is not working. And then they went to this, a different form of prayer. And they said, and only one or two were getting it. They said, this is not working. And centuries, what came out of the desert? This single sentence came out. So, the attainment of prayer. We're going to delve into it now. Our goal is to attain the state of prayer, the ceaseless prayer of the heart. The constant remembrance of God. That's our starting point. It begins with ordering our external life so as to avoid mortal sins and to begin the practice of obedience towards God's command to love. You're not going to be perfect at it, but you're going to try, try and practicing it in your life. And they're very big on the fact that you have to read scripture. Why? It warms up your heart. Yeah, helps you to fall in love with Christ. You've got to pray for the world and feed the poor. So a big part of informing the interior life, this was taught to me two weeks ago, right? Like it's essential, is to have compassion towards the world, right? So it's a big part to have, to, to practice compassion towards the world. At the same time, we begin the battle. This is it. This is the battle. Yeah, Not out here. Not out here. Here is the battle. We begin the battle of the interior life. We practice the remembrance of God. We don't have the remembrance of God. But we don't have prayer yet. But we practice having it over and over and over again. And when we practice the remembrance of God, we are asking, this is the question... Who is at the center of my life? Me or God? When you start this practice, I promise you this will happen <laughs> without fail. You will quickly discover that you are very much at the center of your life. Yeah, And it's become more and more apparent to me. Yeah, This is fundamentally, people, what pride is. Pride is that is the question that answers, I'm at the centre of my life. All right? That's what pride is. We know, oh, you know, he, he talks very highly, but that's not pride. Pride is fundamentally who's at the centre of your life. Much of our prayer today is us asking God to sort out our exterior life, our exterior problems, our exterior situations, my job, my car, my, you know, my this, my that. That's where much of our prayer is focused. Right? Very little is focused here. And so, rosary, amazing, fantastic. Mary said, pray it for the world. It forms part of our compassion. All right? It's a necessary thing. But we get fixated on getting God to sort our exterior life. When in the prophecy of Ezekiel was, no, I'm coming to sort your interior life first because it's a bit of a mess. All right? And that way I can abide in you. So, the art of prayer, the inner life, begins with this. Why is this uh, prayer so effective? It's not got nothing to do with the words. A little bit with the words. It's got nothing to do with them. It's got nothing to do with how many times you say the sentence. Right? The key to this prayer, the word, you all need to remember, is attention. This is where the battle takes place, maintaining attention. And they also discovered great, great power in the name of Jesus. Prayer is fundamentally about Jesus. All right? Fundamentally about him. And it's about having our attention on him. Not our intentions. Our attention. So back to the desert monks. When the Desert Fathers began their spiritual life, they would say the Jesus prayer morning, noon, and night without stopping. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Why was this effective for them? This is the first reason. 
they discovered that the shortness of this sentence, it was short, it's called an arrow prayer, stopped their minds from wondering. And with, because they discovered 150 psalms a day, they discovered that they were able to memorize 150 psalms, and they were starting to say them by rote, but they were thinking about themselves in all different situations. Right? And so what they realized, very wordy prayers cause your imagination to wander off. And we'll, we'll discuss why in a sec, yeah? But when they last focused, the short prayer was short enough to get them snapped back into attention. So their mind would wander with long prayers. But with the short prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. You were more conscious when you lost attention. Where with long prayers, you could go drifting off. The key is, when you pray, to always have Jesus at the center of your mind and your heart. This is it. Attention. The word is attention. Jesus is the center of your life, not you. So distractions. All right? Oh, I've got a great story on this one. What you'll discover is that when you begin to practice putting Jesus at the center of your life, your pride will flare up. It will just... yeah, And you'll be bombarded with distractions. Bombarded, right? That simple prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Suddenly, your passions, right? You'll try to keep attention. You'll try. You'll try at the start to keep attention on Jesus. And suddenly, excuses, thoughts, worries, fears, insights, anxieties, temptations... They will just come at you at once. What's happening here is your pride and the devil is trying to reassert you back into the center. So you're trying to keep focused attention on Jesus and suddenly your passions are being used against you. Your thoughts, your fears, your anxieties. And what's happening is you're trying to make it about you again. Begin to participate. Watch what happens, yeah? And you'll be there. And your next one, you go, two minutes go by, and go, oh my God, I was thinking about my essay again. Yeah? My fear of the essay. Yeah? Oh boy. You don't like you being removed from the center. You do not like it. In the beginning stages of the spiritual life, we are self centered creatures. What was the principal vice of the fall of Adam and Eve? What was the vice? Pride. They put themselves at the center. The very start of prayer is the undoing of the fall. Right? Which is the undoing of you at the center of your life and putting God back at the center. And it is a fight. Alright? It is. And it's about purging the purgative. It's about purging our self-centeredness from us and becoming Christ-centered. Right? Just because I received the sacraments and baptized and received the Eucharist, that does not mean God's at the center. That does not mean, yeah? God gave us the Holy Spirit to put himself back at the center. Why? Because we have no power against our pride. To begin with. And so this happens. So when you begin, you will discover, here's a trap. I fell into this. Someone had to correct me. Right? Oh, it's so subtle. You'll discover the type of pride you have. And you'll start thinking, oh, I've got an insight about myself. Who am I thinking about? Myself. Yeah? I'm like, oh, it's very interesting about me. I didn't know that about me. Me, 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 me. Yeah? Yeah? And then, you know, you've done 10 minutes, you've gone, oh, it's all been about me again, yeah? Mm -hmm. And what is, it's so subtle. Temptations, oh, I bet you didn't know about this about yourself. Have a look at that. Oh, look at that, yeah? Uh, God, <coughs> boom, pulls you off. So we are to say to Jesus prayer constantly. The, the, all these people would go to these saints and they would say, um, <coughs> they would say, how often do I say to Jesus prayer? All the time. All the time. Don't stop. Don't stop saying it. It's not about the number of times you say it. It's got nothing to do with the number of times you say it. 
It's about a con creating the constant attention. It's about that battle between who has the centre. <coughs> it's about destroying pride. The purgative is solely about pride at this stage. Why is the prayer effective for attention? The prayer focuses on Jesus and it focuses on our nothingness without yes. Jesus. Now that sentence picks our, pricks our pride already. Nothing without Jesus? I'm nothing without God. It's about, <coughs> see, there's uh, that sense of, you know, I am something. You know, you're not. <laughs> without God, you're not. This is, this is how unbelievably seditious this fight is, right? So it's split into two. Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me as sin. So why is this effective? Because when you're saying it, remember, it's not about just having your, your I use my rosary beads, yeah? It's not just about having it and just going, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me as sin, or Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me as sin. Is there any attention to what I'm saying? No. Zero, right? So how do you use the prayer with attention to keep Jesus at the center? When we say the Lord Jesus, we internally move towards with our feelings of love towards him because we know who he is now you may not actually have love for him yeah at this point but you're recognizing who he is why it's important to read scripture and you're saying it's you it's you it's not me it's you it's you it's you that's what you're saying in your mind. it's you you know and then you'll have sometimes it'll be dry and sometimes you'll be, just feel this whoa i feel love yeah? But what you're saying is, it's you, it's you, Jesus, it's you, I have faith. And when we say, have mercy on me, a sinner, we eternally acknowledge that to move forward, we need him to act. That we're nothing without him. Right? So, it's this, what, as this monk said to me, it's this moving up in agape, in love, yeah? And then it's this acknowledgement of needing him. And that keeps your attention on him. Right? That keeps your attention. But then you'll start getting bombarded. When I say the prayer, I try to feel. So you'll hear a lot of people, oh, don't have any feelings in prayer. Yeah? No, do! <laughs> Love him! <laughs> Love him in prayer. Right? Because it's the feelings. Right? So what I, I try to feel as if I'm looking up at him. And then placing my hand on him, asking to save me as if I need him. It's that movement, looking up and, and saying, it's you. And so the Jesus prayer is effectively, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. And, uh, and what it is, it's a constant attention of love and contrition. Right? Towards Jesus. This is attention. Now sometimes you may not have the deep emotion, yeah? But you're moving your whole interior life to be attentive to Jesus. You're not just moving, what, we, what I was doing, I was just moving my lips, reciting something, yeah? And then I realized it's about attention. It's about moving the interior life towards him over and over and over again. And every time you move that interior life, your pride's pulling you back. It's pulling you back. Yeah, and you're moving forward, yeah? And believe me, when you engage in this, this is something. So Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on the sinner. Not only that, it builds up the three cardinal vir theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. We call upon the name of Jesus in faith. Why are we talking to Jesus? Because we believe who he is. Yeah? And we ask for his mercy. Why? Because we hope in this. And we move towards them. How? Love. So this one sentence they discovered, when done correctly, builds up faith, hope, and love. It focuses our attention on Jesus, and we engage in the battle of the self, reasserting God at the center. That's why they said this is it. What to expect when you begin? We're on the last three slides now. Thank you for putting up with me. Um, 
What to expect when you begin? Constant distractions. Constant, right? Don't stop praying because you are distracted. That, this is the whole point. Coming to terms and dealing with the distractions. Overcoming the distractions is the battle. At the, at the early stage of our prayer life, at the construction of the kingdom of God within us, yeah? This is it. This is what we have to begin with. Distractions are pride, you trying to make yourself back to the centre. This is why this stage, they say, is not truly prayer. It's a fight. It's a prayer fight. Right? You're fighting yourself to have God at the centre. And uh, I had this one, one woman, and she was bringing up talking to me about it. And she says, well, the other day I just threw down my beads because when I was saying the, distra- when I was saying the prayers, all I could think about was this guy in work who annoyed me. <laughs> and I said, no, that was the battle. That was it. That was it. And she went, and afterwards she went, oh, my God. She said, I just thought I was praying badly. And I said, no, you were doing it right. Yeah? But you, miss, you mistook. Your pride won. Pride won. Yeah? That's, it can get, um, when I started, do you, know what my, do you know what my one was? Anger. Anger at Jesus. And it's found bad, I know. Why are you making me go through this? And it was this hermit that corrected me. And he goes, oh, you just love yourself, don't you? Yeah. Oh, you're just so disappointed that someone as great as you has to go through this. You know what I mean, yeah? Oh, oh my God. You know, yeah? When you start this, if you do, and you're feeling anything, no, I'm not saying a spiritual, talk to each other, talk to me or anything like that. And just go, what does this mean, yeah? You will be so shocked at how sneaky pride is. So anger, frustration, and temptation will come at you. Jesus is not a pearl clutcher. Yeah, Jesus is not there going, oh my God, I can't believe he's feeling angry at me. Yeah, Jesus knows it. He's giving you the Holy Spirit to enter into it. Yeah, so I, I, I then I started to feel guilt over getting angry at Jesus. Yeah, but who was I, who was I sad about? Me. <laughs> you know, it's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> I have another friend, all sorts of temptations are coming his way. Images, thoughts, and I won't, you know, yeah, but you can think it, yeah? He said, I've never had this before. Yeah? Entering into it. Boom! He's getting some real images, yeah? Sweetness. I know it sounds weird to put that in all of a sudden. But sweetness emerges. And desire to keep doing it emerges. Why? Because it's not you doing this. It's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Once you start thinking, oh, I'll do my prayers today. I will do this. I will do that. I will. You know, there it is, yeah? Mm. The gift to even enter is it's a gift. And when you finish your thing, there is this sweetness that comes with it. And it's Moorish. Yeah? It really is Moorish. Because you've just spent time having Jesus at the center of your life. And then you're starting to go, I've just had a teeny little taste of the joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. And I want more. Right? So, at a time only known to God, he will give you the gift of true contrition. So remember I said we moved to Jesus saying, you know what I mean, I'm, I'm nothing without you. The truth is, you don't really believe that yet. Right? You are making the act of it. But deep down, you don't really truly believe. It's a bit like, you know, it's a bit down, as St. Joseph of Hesychat says, you kind of do believe that you are the kind of, you know, should be Jew, the gift, I put a lot of work in. You know what I mean? Yeah? Then God says, you want contrition? I'll give you true contrition. And this is the moment where he breaks the heart of stone. This is it. This is the moment he shatters the heart of stone. He will literally pierce your heart with the Holy Spirit. Right, so the first bit is battle, yeah? The fight. But then he'll come and he'll literally pierce your heart with the Holy Spirit and you'll have true repentance and a true change of heart. And all the saints say, this is the type of tradition God gives you. 
This is not the type of contrition I have. <laughs> right? When I say my Jesus prayer. This is what God will give you. This type of contrition. An identity with Jesus on the cross is what he'll give you. Yeah. And at this point they say, uh, many tears come because you finally see. You finally get it. And it's a gift. And according to says, the Holy Spirit no longer acts on you in an external way, but now acts in you internally. I know he's already internal, did that, but he enters your heart, they say. It's an internal way. And your mind, from the wound in the heart, this is St. Joseph Hesychat who wrote this, from the wound in the heart, and St. John the Cross, from the wound in the heart, he makes, your mind can finally enter your heart. So your heart and your mind pray as one. It's all a gift. You don't do any of this. Yeah? So, and this is still the purgative stage. So it's at this point you begin to pray. Because whatever it is, whatever God sees in us, maybe we have sufficient faith, hope, and love at this point. Yeah? So maybe our attention, maybe, I don't know. They don't know, they say, why God does it. But God determines at a time, and he goes, boom, pierces your heart. And then, boom, they say, you, you, you pray in a completely new way. So the death of self is a gift. Prayer is a gift, and Christ is a gift. So these two last slides on the Jesus prayer, these are normally questions I've been getting thrown at me lately. When to say the prayer? Try to always say the prayer. Always. Remember, it's not numbers, it's attention, right? Walking, washing, eating, working, waiting. You know, on my way to here yesterday, standing at the bus stop, sitting on the bus. Now, I could have been on my phone looking at the rugby, yeah, right? Or I was practicing the art of attention on my Lord. And so you can do this anywhere. Walking, washing, waiting, all that sort of stuff. Learn attention. You're learning to be attentive. And then put some real hardcore time in, morning and evening. That's what I do. And I tell you, I do it before going to bed, even when I'm late. And I feel my mind is better. Because when I go to bed, at the end of the day, it's me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah, everything that happens, everything that people said to me, you know what I mean, yeah? This, you're putting on your attention on Christ before sleeping. Why? What to do when badly distracted? This is very important. I want to, this, this is very important because there's going to be moments when the distraction is unbearable. When it's really bad, stop saying the Jesus prayer and remake your intentions. Words without attention are useless. Yeah, that's just me bashing out. Right? Once, once you, once pride's got you. Yeah? Or once the devil or enemy's got you, stop and reassert your intentions. So regain attention by remaking your intentions and then proceed. And so what I do is, and this was taught to me, right? I didn't come up with this, this was handed on to me. They are Father. Yeah? Father. So stop. What I do is, I give you my example, what I do is I stand up and I go, Father. May your name be made holy. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done. Alright? And then, I, say, I acknowledge, I, I, I activate my faith again. And I go, I go, I am in the presence of Christ. He sees me and he hears me. I'm doing this in his presence. And then I was given a quote by Jeremiah. Turn me, Lord, and I shall be turned. It's God's job to turn us to him. All right? And so they're my little... You, know, you might have a different intention. Yeah? But what it does is, it's, it, it re, who, your intention refocuses back onto God. And then you go back into it again. So, if your distractions are really bad, and you've lost our attention, remake your intentions and proceed. Continuing... In such a way. So, last slide. What position should I pray in? Right. Whatever position maintains attention, pray in it. All right? Stand, sit, kneel, lie down, eyes open, eyes closed, I don't care, no scent cares. All right? 
It doesn't matter as long as attention is being maintained. Do you understand that? Oh, God will love me more if I'm on my knees. Yeah, I'm on my knees thinking about how sore my knees are. <laughs> All right? I've lost attention. Yeah? I can't sit. Joe said, Joseph said, lie down. Yeah? Um, I've got to perhaps stand. You know what I mean? Oh, everyone's distracted me. Close your eyes. Yeah? Do you understand? It's attention. If distractions get bad, this is what I do when distractions, I stand. Yeah? And I kind of reconfigure myself and I remake my intentions. Then I kneel or I sit. Yeah? Eyes open, eyes shut. Whatever keeps your attention. Should I say vocally or mentally? What do you think the answer is? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What, what matters? Attention. attention. Whatever maintains attention, the saints say. Yeah? Say it with your lips until your lips get tired, then say it mentally. When you mentally get tired, say it with your lips. Right? The subtlety of the devil and your pride is incredible. Your pride will not die without a fight. So be prepared and always know you have the Holy Spirit empowering you to do. This isn't you on your own. You are being empowered by the Spirit to do it. Because God wants to give us his life. And he is constructing his kingdom within you. So that's it. So... The relationship between baptism and the Eucharist depends on our spiritual life, all right? For Christ to abide in us. And that means we've got to do battle. And that, the very start of battle is putting ourselves to death, putting God at the center, not me. And I've given you, there's other techniques, yeah? But I've given you one that's been going on for over 1,800 years, all right? And it's not about words, in the sense. You understand? It's about attention. And that is the battle. And then from there, God will reward you, and you'll move on. And this is why I said everyone's called to be a contemplative. Because at the end of the day, Christ is at the center. Right? And this is how they, they've done it. And it's literally the beginning of the undoing of the fall. So that's it. That ends the talk. I hope... Everything has been led to some nice sort of conclusion you can go off with. And Father is in talk with Father Antonio. Yes, so just to explain this. So, yeah. um, well, first of all, I mean, what do we say? What do we say? Yeah. <laughs>